So let's talk about the Anti Pharaoh. The Anti Pharaoh is essentially a move that allows you to separate the cards one by one in an A and B pattern. So essentially, it does the opposite of a Pharaoh Shuffle. So the Pharaoh Shuffle essentially is a perfect weaving of the cards. So it does this, right? And then you square everything up into one. The Anti Pharaoh, as the name implies, does the opposite. It actually unweaves those cards into an A, B, A, B, A pattern. Right? So I actually got the permission of the creator himself, Christian Emblem, to teach this move. So everybody please, uh, yeah, just DM him uh, with like kind words saying thank you. Or, you know, better yet, just buy his products. Buy his products, he's a great magician, he's a great thinker. And I think it's kind of a shame that his most renowned, renowned uh, product is the anti -pharaoh. Not that it's a bad product, but because I think that he has so much more to offer, and it's just a shame that, you know, out of all those things, it's just the anti uh, which is uh, which is a cool idea, but yeah, it's not his coolest idea, I guess. So the only condition that uh, he gave uh, for me teaching this move was that I don't teach what the move is used for. So this move isn't going to have an applications idea, uh, no idea, but a section. So the application section is usually where I place my ideas or where I place like just like some some tidbits of information on how to use it. This video is not going to have that. So, you know, uh, yeah, but honestly, I'm still going to like give a whole bunch of details regarding how to do this move. So, yeah, but the hard part of the move is doing the move consistently. The mechanics are actually pretty simple. Um, but yeah, get ready to uh, wreck a couple of decks of cards to, uh, to practice this move. So a couple of pros regarding this move. Um, if you're going to invest time into learning move, uh, you should at least be, uh, you should at least know what the move, uh, has to offer. So, um, the move is, um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm just joking, but in all seriousness, it, I mean, it is a very cool move, but it's also a very efficient move. Right? All other methods that, that do separate the cards uh, in an ABAB pattern are either slower or they require you to do something beforehand. This move is you just do it and then you're done, right? So in that regard, it is very efficient in what it does. A couple of cons regarding the anti pharaoh is that it's actually a very difficult move to do consistently, right? And even the most consistent of people uh, who do the anti pharaoh have uh, difficulty doing it back to back to back perfectly, right? So think about how much time and effort you want to put into this move, especially because you can't even really like control it consistently. Early on in the pro section, I mentioned other moves. Those other moves, uh, well, they're less efficient, but at least they're more consistent. So think about the effects that you want to perform think about in what context you want to do them in, and then see which move actually fits uh, fits your your uh, your situation better, right? So do you want efficiency or do you want consistency? So think about that. And another thing about the anti pharaoh is that it's actually a move that relies on outside factors as well. So even if you're the most skilled person at the anti pharaoh, if you suddenly receive a deck that you're not familiar with or your hand has like, I don't know, your hand is like cramping up from doing too many anti pharaohs, which happened to me uh, a couple of times, um, chances are you aren't going to get the move perfectly. So you want to take that into account. So the history behind the move is actually it's actually pretty interesting, I would say. Um, so it's actually not to be uh, not to be confused with a Juan Tamariz uh, Juan Tamariz uh, principle called the anti pharaoh, which is actually a math principle regarding the pharaoh shuffle. Funnily enough, he actually uh, Christian Emblem actually created the anti pharaoh to get into a Juan Tamariz thing, uh, which doesn't help with the confusing uh, confusion part uh, con confusion. Uh, but you know, I digress. The concept of doing a fair shuffle backwards has actually existed for for quite a, uh, quite a while now, I would say. So Charles T. Jordan uh, actually used it uh, used a backwards fair shuffle in something called the discard trick in uh, in a book published uh, back in 1921 called the the Four Full Hands. The Encyclopedia of Card Tricks, published back in 1937, which is now a classic of all books uh, by Gene Ugard and Frederick Browley. 
also has an entry on a backwards Pharaoh shuffle, and they actually use it in, a, in an effect called double prediction. But uh, what they did uh, for the anti Pharaoh was actually drastically different, right? So the old school, uh, the old school anti Pharaoh was actually them just going through the deck and then up jogging, down jogging, up jogging, down jogging, up jogging, down jogging cards, right? So that was what the anti Pharaoh looked like back then. But you know what Christian Emblem did was that he actually streamlined the entire process, and that became the anti Pharaoh slight. The anti Pharaoh Slight was actually first published in a DVD, I think it was a DVD, back in 2006 called uh, Que Jajo. Uh, I can't Spanish, so I, I really apologize for that, uh, with Danny Dortiz. So uh, that's that's kind of cool. Uh, there's also like a whole bunch of other ideas in, the, in that DVD. I'm not going to say the name again because I can't Spanish. Um, there's a uh, the move actually became its own project back in 2012. So in that project, uh, Christian Emblem sat down with Alex Pandrea and R. Paul Wilson, where they sort of shared ideas. And then there were actually several theories as to how the move actually worked, which uh, I'll get to uh, right about now. So before Christian Emblem actually discovered why the move worked, there are actually two main theories behind uh, the move, right? The first one is by Christian Emblem himself, and that is because of the bend of the cards. So when you're doing a spring, you'll notice that you're actually bending the heck out of these cards. Uh, so his theory was that, you know, as the card is being sprung off, this A card is still going to be bent, and then a B card that's bent is going to hit this A card and then bounce backwards, right? And this B card is still going to be bent, which causes the, the next A card to slide off of this bend and go forward. But this A card is going to be bent, which causes this next B card to hit this bend and then go backwards, right? So this pattern re uh, repeats throughout the entire deck. And you know, that's, uh, that's the main theory behind why the anti pharaoh worked, uh, according to Christian Emblem. The second main theory was actually made by a Swedish physicist. And the theory had to do with like the motion of the card, the friction of the card, and uh, it was apparently like a very convoluted theory. And apparently they even sent like a, a two page thesis on why it worked to Christian Emblem. Um, but the real reason was it wasn't actually captured until Dan and Dave uh, shot the move in a slow motion camera. And the reason why the, uh, the anti pharaoh actually works is because they're actually not being shot in an ABAB pattern. They're actually being shot in the ABAABB pattern. So what this means is that they're not shot out individually. They're actually shot out in pairs. So what this means is that because they're being shot in pairs and there's momentum and this card hits first, this card, the card on top, is actually going to be launched forward, right? And because this card is launched forward, the next pair is going to get trapped over here this card is going to get trapped by the next upcoming pair, and then this card is going to launch forward as well, right? And this repeats throughout the entire deck, and that's the uh, that's the exact reason as to how the anti pharaoh actually works. The deck actually plays a huge role in the move, right? Depending on the deck, you might have an easier or a harder time with the move. But I tested it with a variety of decks in my collection. And so I'll tell you uh, which deck I had the easiest time with, right? And again, this is just personal preference. Um, so the move for me is actually easier with a softer deck. So if you have a Taiwan or a China or a uh, Forni deck, I wouldn't recommend these cards. Rather, what I would recommend is actually this deck. This deck is a broken in uh, bicycle, uh, well, crushed bicycle slash retail stock deck. Uh, so these are great for an Etsy Pharaoh. Or if, uh, if you have access, these are my favorite. These are the Slimline B9 Finish or an E7 Cardamundi deck. These are soft and thin, which I think is actually great for the Anti Pharaoh. These are more expensive, uh, expensive though. So if you're on a budget or don't really have access to these cards, I would just recommend you to get a Penguin Elite bicycle deck. Um, those are cheap and they're great. And you know, you just need to break them in uh, and you know, they'll work fine. Just a couple of heads up before uh, we go into the move or going further into the move. 
Um, this move is basically a modified old school fingertip spring. So I recommend you to check out my video on the spring first. Um, yeah, if you don't know how to do the spring, you're not going to know how to do the anti pharaoh. So again, this video isn't going anywhere. So take your time, learn the spring first, learn the variety of grips that you can do with the spring, and then come back and revisit this move. So yeah. The second heads up that I want to give is that because this move is a pressure move, because this move is a spring, if you're planning on practicing this move, you want to practice the move with either a deck that you don't care about or a deck that you know you want to dedicate to this move, right? Because again, you're going to wear out this deck really, really fast because you're breaking down the fibers of um, of the paper. So you know, just uh, just make sure that you know you're not sacrificing a deck that you really like or an expensive deck of cards, right? And then the third heads up that I want to give is that this move is extremely difficult to get down consistently. Even people who have mastered this move still make mistakes. So honestly, don't worry about it, right? Take your time. This move isn't an, uh, like an, uh, an important move, right? This move is, you know, just, just a move that exists. So honestly, take your time, take it slowly, and then, you know, just learn it at your own rhythm. So before I go into the anti pharaoh itself, I'd like to go into the catching hand. So believe it or not, your left hand, uh, the, the hand that catches the cards, actually plays a role in your anti pharaoh. So if you watch my spring video, you'll know that I tell you to form a cradle with your, ca uh, with your catching hand to catch the cards. Right? You will need to modify the, the cradle to, uh, to fit this move. So rather than the traditional spring cradle, where it's basically a modified, um, a modified straddle grip where it looks like this, right? Uh, you want to open your hand and your fingers. So rather than abruptly bending your joints like this, you're gonna want to have a, a softer and a more gradual incline, right? So you're just going to just gently open up your hand and then just have a nice incline like so, right? So if you have a, uh, so the reason why you're doing this is that if you have a traditional uh, spring cradle, there won't be enough cards for the cards to, uh, there won't be enough space rather for the cards to separate, right? So if I do this with a spring cradle, there won't be space for the cards to separate. But if I actually expand my cradle, I can have so much more space for the cards to separate. Right? So make sure that you expand your cradle and just have this soft incline so then the cards don't just stop abruptly and then they won't separate. So yeah, just uh, just make sure that you have a lot of space in your cradle. And also, this isn't a spring that's dedicated on distance, right? It's uh, it's dedicated on, well, I mean, there, there is a distance factor involved, but your, the cards won't go anywhere, so you don't really need a closed uh, cradle for that. So just open it, and then we should be good for the move. So this is how I do the anti pharaoh and you'll know why I said that in the uh, tips and practice section. But for now, let's get into how I do the anti pharaoh I'm in an old school spring grip with my right index, uh, middle ring, and pinky finger uh, contacting the front short edge of the deck, so they're over here. Um, so the pinky doesn't really do anything, it's just there for decoration, but honestly, it's there because it looks better that way. Because if it's anywhere else, it just looks odd, so make sure that it's also like in line with your other fingers. So uh, what's more, uh, like I'll, I'll get more specific, but it's actually the fingertips that are contacting the front edge of the deck, like so, right? Um, the thumb is on the back short edge of the deck. It's actually deeper into my thumb. So rather than being at my fingertips, the short edge is actually deeper into my thumb, right? And the reason for that is because I don't want the card slipping out from the back. Because if I have this from the back as well, there are chances that the cards can slip out from the back, which uh, which I don't want to happen. So the thumb acts as a stopper at the back, right? The very next step that you're going to do is you're, you're going to bend the deck, right? And as you bend the deck, you'll notice that because you're holding the deck at the fingertips, you're actually creating a bevel. So notice here, there's actually an incline here. So if I remove my fingers, I can actually riffle off of this. 
this bevel will actually allow you to control the pressure a lot better. Uh, so yeah. But before you start spraying, I actually want you to move your right hand backwards, right? So, uh, so your current position is this, you have your cradle over here, like you're doing a traditional spring, but you're actually going to move your right hand backwards, right? So I want you to start the spring right below the center of the palm. So around like over in this area, right? So again, I already told you to expand the cradle, which will contribute to it, but because um, even if you expand the cradle, if you still do the spring from this uh, from this space, there still won't be enough space for the uh, for the cards to fully separate. But if you move the hand backwards, now there is way more space uh, for the cards to separate, right? For the cards to glide. So the expanded cradle and also the movement of the deck backwards will allow you to um to uh yeah to allow the cards to fully separate so the reason for moving the deck backwards is so that you can actually do the spring um uh do the spring around here right so right so if you're familiar with traditional spring you usually aim for the fingers but for this sort of spring you sort of want to aim for this area over here right so that's why you're moving the deck backwards so you'll notice that the uh, that the spring is about five centimeters above my left hand, so over here, and uh, yeah, it, it, the deck just sort of wraps around of my left hand, which is uh, kind of weird, but you know that's that's how it is, right? So it sort of goes like this, and uh, here I'm going to start the spring, right? So I move my deck backwards, and I'm ready to do the spring, right? But I don't want this to be a normal flourish spring. I want this spring to be controlled, hence why I want this bevel, right? So you'll notice that when I bend this deck extremely uh, a lot, you'll notice that I have a more extreme bevel. So this, uh, this actually allows me to spring the cards forward and not downwards, and that's important. So when you do springs, you'll notice that most of the time, you're going to spring them downwards, right? You don't want that for the... Uh, for the anti pharaoh because if you spring them downwards, you're, there, there's no chance for the cards to separate because rather than going forward and then letting the cards glide on top of one another, they're just going to hit one another instead, right? So you want to shoot the spring forwards. So at its core, the anti pharaoh is really just a spring that you're shooting forwards. That's really all that's different, right? The only thing that makes it different from a normal spring is the fact that you're expanding the cradle, you're moving your spring backwards, and then you're shooting the cards forward by releasing pressure, by flattening out your fingers. And that's basically the only thing, the only things that cause a spring to become an anti pharaoh But a couple of things, right? So as you practice the anti pharaoh I want you to notice the amount of pressure that you're applying. Right? You're also, you should also notice the distance between the deck and your left palm, the speed of the flourish, and the rhythm of the flourish. Right? My anti pharaoh itself, not counting like the setup or the cleanup afterwards, just the spring itself takes about two seconds. So that's about the speed that I take for my anti pharaoh, and that's about the rhythm. So I, that should be a, um, a good reference, I think. Um, I'll, over, I'll go over this more in the tips and tricks, uh, tips and practice section rather. But basically, that's all there is for the anti pharaoh. Mechanics wise, there's there's really there's really not much about it. it. I mean, it's not even like that difficult. But and there's one tip of advice that I can give you is stay hyper aware of the spring that you're doing. Right? That's that's basically the only thing. The reason why uh, the download doesn't go much over the mechanics of the anti pharaoh is because at its core, it's a spring, right? There's there's only so much that you can modify or uh, say about a spring that you know people can uh, sort of understand, right?
So after you're done the anti pharaoh so you're over here, right? So uh, that's not a good anti pharaoh but eh, whatever. So after you're done the anti pharaoh you're going to want to push the packets in, but not all the way in. And uh, you're going to want to push them in uh, one into another until all the cards on one side are basically equal with uh, one another, right? So now these cards are more or less equal over here, right? So now you'll notice that uh, this deck is actually raised into an elevated dealer's grip, right? So uh, this is a normal dealer's grip. So as I square everything up, I'm actually moving it into an elevated dealer's grip like so. So to strip the cards out from uh, one another, I'm actually just going to move my right index to contact the upper right corner of this packet over here. And I'm actually going to contact the bottom right corner of this packet with my right middle finger. So over here. And notice how my left thumb is actually basically in the center of the deck. This allows it to act as a pivot point uh, where you move both packets to, uh, to the left, right? So here you'll notice that when I move, when I move my index to the left and I move my middle finger to the uh, to the left, because I'm basically just contacting these exposed cards, this allows me to strip out all of the exposed cards into an angle jog, right? So now I have this position. So now it's sort of like a weird, um, weird gun position, I guess. So now that you have uh, both packets distinctly separate, uh, separated in a sort of like sideways V or like a cascade thing, you can then move the packets out from one another and then just strain them out. And now you can display your anti pharaoh. That's not a good anti pharaoh, but you know, that's uh, that's whatever, right? And then you can completely separate the halves to, uh, to then give the deck a cut or whatever. So this basically completes the anti pharaoh. There's not much to it, honestly. Um, just to recap for the anti pharaoh, uh, expand your cradle, move your spring backwards, uh, notice the distance, and then just uh, just shoot the cards forward by flattening out your fingers. And that should be it for the anti pharaoh. If you want to separate the deck, contact the upper packet with your index, contact the lower packet with your middle finger swivel them out and then just uh, strain them out and then you have both packets separated. Ooh, this deck is so sticky now, <laughs> ew. Okay, but that's, uh, that's uh, yeah, that's it for the anti pharaoh. So this is going to be the bulk of the anti pharaoh. So again, the mechanics of the move are simple, but it's the tweaks along the way that make this move possible, right? Um, something that's uh, pretty interesting is that it's sort of difficult to give like exact tweaks or exact tips to the anti pharaoh because what's really interesting is that everyone actually does the anti pharaoh somewhat differently, right? Because of how reliant it is on pressure, on rhythm, and on the deck itself, right? Everyone actually has their own way of, you know, just doing the move. So my method of anti pharaoh might not actually work for you. It might not actually work for the creator himself. So honestly, the move is a knack. It consists of a bunch of practice and also being patient in a way that is comfortable to you. So really you have to get comfortable with being aware of the spring. But that doesn't mean that there's uh, there's like 
<laughs> that doesn't mean that there's no like universal tips. So I'll try and give some tips that were given to me and also some that I've discovered along the way. So the first and foremost tip is that rhythm is key. The speed of the move doesn't really matter. You can just like blitz through it or you can go like really slow. It doesn't matter, right? All that matters is that the rhythm across the move is consistent. But to get a consistent rhythm across the move, you have to adjust the pressure that you apply onto the deck as the move goes on. So I've discovered that as the quantity quantity sorry of the cards in your hand decreases you have to apply more pressure so this may seem counterintuitive uh i'll, I'll quote uh if there's less cards doesn't that mean i need get i get to apply less pressure unquote uh normally yes but because you're doing this throughout the entire deck you need to increase pressure to maintain the same rhythm so let's uh let's just look at a normal spring right this is a normal spring, but look at how, how the spring goes if I don't increase pressure. It just stops because I need to apply more pressure to keep up the spring, right? So this works on the exact same principle. I have to increase pressure so that the spring continues, right? So it just stops. So I want you to, to just apply more pressure gradually as the move continues so rather than just doing this and then just having it stop just gradually increase pressure as it goes right so just uh so notice how i'm actually bending the cards a lot more as the move progresses right so over here so here i'm bending the heck the, the heck out of these cards right so there we go and so yeah that's the first tip for the uh, for the anti pharaoh. Now, what's really interesting about that part about rhythm is that you can actually hear the rhythm, right? So, if I actually try and uh, botch the uh, rhythm, right? You can actually hear. Uh, hold up, no, that was actually too good. <laughs> so, if I try and uh, try and botch the rhythm just a bit, like over there, you actually hear uh, the effects of the uh, of the. Um, of the anti pharaoh and you can actually see that some parts of it are considerably worse than the parts where there was a consistent rhythm right so over here you can tell that i didn't have a consistent rhythm throughout over here right so you can tell that the bottom was where i had the most consistent of rhythms so honestly like if you're you don't even need to look at your hands to do the anti pharaoh honestly because most of the time you can actually hear the rhythm and you can actually sort of feel it as well. So uh, if you're if you're used to doing springs, then you can actually tell when the cards actually get caught up in your fingers. And when the cards get caught up in your fingers, well, that breaks up the rhythm, and then as a result, uh, you know, the anti pharaoh doesn't work. So again, um, there's not really like a key to um, to getting a specific rhythm going. It's it's more or less just again, it's uh, you have to. Uh, gradually increase the amount of pressure as you do the spring and honestly the rest is just yeah it's just practice 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 how to get a consistent rhythm going right and again this is your rhythm my rhythm might be different for, from yours and uh, yeah just uh, just try and do a bunch of springs at different speeds consistent speeds rather and that forms a rhythm all right so uh, yeah, that's about it for this tidbit of uh, rhythm. Another tip is that you want to continue the move throughout the entire deck. The hardest part of the anti pharaoh is actually the bottom and the top stock. So these, these parts over here, right? So if you want to do the move, uh, you're going to have to uh, make sure that you're doing the move until the very last second and not just like releasing everything for whatever reason, right? So sometimes I see uh, people do this, right? And that's not, you see, I just released an entire block, right? Which isn't ideal. So what I want to do is that I want to continue this spring until the last second. And this will allow me to at least get, you know, some separation, right? But you can also play around with these, uh, with these factors, right? So there's three factors that you can also play around with. And that is the stock of the deck, right? Just because I have an easier time with softer decks 
doesn't mean that uh, that you'll have an easier time with softer decks as well. If you have a stronger grip strength, then try out like Taiwan cards. Maybe you'll have an easier time anti pharaohing these. Personally, I struggle a lot with these, right? So you can inst instantly see that the quality of the anti pharaoh went downwards. But, you know, play around with the stock and the finish of the deck. Maybe that will help you improve your anti pharaoh right? The, another factor you can play around with is play around with the grip of the spring, right? I do it from a fingertip, uh, fingertips, uh, from my fingertips, right? But again, just because it works for me doesn't mean that it'll work for you. Maybe you can do a, uh, a corner spring and that'll work well for you, right? Maybe you can do a, a traditional fingertip spring again, but from the back, right? Or maybe you can do it from, oh, wait, that's actually not bad. <laughs> but, or maybe you can do like the spring from this, this grip, right? It really doesn't matter, but you have to play around with, uh, with, the, uh, with the grip. The third factor that you can play around with is actually just play around with the spring, right? The distance that it's shot from. So notice how I said like it's shot from above five centimeters from above of your left hand. That might not apply to you. Or maybe the pressure that the amount of pressure that you apply, right? So I applied this much pressure. Maybe you need to apply more. Maybe you can apply less, right? The speed of the move, right? Again, I said two seconds. Maybe you can do it faster. Maybe you can do it slower. It doesn't matter. All those factors contribute to the anti pharaoh. So play around with these three factors and try to find a sweet spot, right? Everything about this video has been around my sweet spot for the move, right? So try and find what works for you, all right? So just, yeah, just, you know, just uh, try and uh, try and discover the move a bit more because there's only so far that this tutorial can take you, especially because I'm not you. I don't know what your hand is like. I don't know what decks you have. So yeah, just play around with the move and yeah, just find what works for you. So fixing mistakes, uh, I'm actually not going to teach you the method that Christian Emblem actually does. You can buy his download for that. Um, honestly, if I mess up the anti pharaoh I just do another one. If I need to fix mistakes at the top and bottom stocks, I just manually go through <laughs> the deck and just fix them, right? Because that's, I mean, because honestly, like most of the time, I don't even need to sort out those mistakes because all of the magic effects that I do revolve around the center stock, right? So as long as I hit the center anti pharaoh which I didn't hit for this one for whatever reason. Okay, right? So as long as I hit these cards, then that's completely fine, right? I don't even need to, you know, correct these mistakes. They're, they're, they don't serve any purpose whatsoever to the magic effect. So I don't need to, I don't need to, um, I don't need to fix these. But you know, if I do need to do like a perfect one, then I would just sort through them, <laughs> right? So honestly, yeah, just. Uh, and honestly, I think that most people watching this would be cardists. So I think they're gonna aim for perfection anyways. So you know. Yeah, honestly, I just redo the anti pharaoh over and over again until I hit a perfect one um, or like a perfect one. So, yeah, there's not really like there's not really like a quick and effective way of fixing mistakes, unfortunately. Um, yeah, they're, they're all they're all very convoluted ways of fixing mistakes. So honestly, I would just recommend you to just do another anti pharaoh if you fail your first one. I mentioned cardistry before, but let's take a magic detour uh, again, right? So let's talk about the external reality of the anti pharaoh. So it's kind of funny. I actually think that the external reality of an anti pharaoh is actually better than that of a passes. So this uh, for the pass, there's actually this awkward moment where you ha you're, where your hands are actually together, right? Doing this, right? The anti pharaoh is an overt action. But I think you can definitely just pass it off as a flourish. So especially if you're, if people see you do this or they see you do like springs or whatever, right? I think you can probably pass it off as just like a fidget, right? For the pass, it's just this. Or, but for the uh, for the anti pharaoh, it's the it has the external reality of just being like a fancy cardistry move, right? So I think I think you can probably pass it off as that. So I think it's kind of funny to see 
what you can get away with, especially if you're bold enough. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just kind of funny. <laughs> but um, there is one tidbit regarding the external reality though, and it's that I think that the external reality actually becomes worse if you need to fix a mistake. So honestly, again, I said like if uh, if I do the anti pharaoh and if I have mistakes, I just redo it. This is the main reason why, right? It's because if the anti pharaoh has an external reality of being a fidget move, why would I want to change that? Because the moment I start paying attention to these mistakes and I start trying to fix them, that's the moment that the external reality becomes. If this really is a fidget move. Why is he paying so much attention to it, right? Why is he paying so much attention to detail to it? So I'd rather just, you know, if I fail my first anti pharaoh, I'd rather just uh, just go through it. I, I'd rather just square everything up and then redo it again and just, just, just pass it off as a fidget move. Because if I do this, the external reality sort of crumbles. So I want to sort of maintain that fidget external reality image, you know? So, you know, but honestly, if um, if you can play it off or if you can provide proper justification as to why you're looking through the deck and then fix the mistakes, go ahead and do it. But me personally, I think that I think it's a lot more efficient and I think it contributes a lot more to the external reality if I just did another uh, anti pharaoh. So here's a couple of notes regarding the anti pharaoh. So if you're ever planning on doing an effect that requires the anti pharaoh, uh, try to do a couple of anti pharaohs first. So uh, again, the anti pharaoh is very deck dependent. So you want to feel the knack of the move uh, for this specific deck before you go out and perform, right? Because if you don't like understand the, the, the stiffness of the deck, the amount of pressure it needs, right? Chances are you won't hit the anti pharaoh perfectly the first time. So you want to get used to the deck before you hop onto an effect that requires the anti pharaoh. If uh, that day you're having like a bad day or whatever, you can't hit the anti pharaoh, just don't do it. Just don't do an effect that requires the anti pharaoh. Just move on, right? I mean, again, the anti pharaoh is a luxury. It's not a need. So, yeah. Um, the second uh, additional note is that you don't need to do the anti pharaoh perfectly. Most applications that I know of and that I do don't require a perfect anti pharaoh. So don't worry too much about it, right? Even for flourishes, if you don't uh, like, if you don't nail the uh, the anti pharaoh perfectly. You can still work with like a couple of mistakes here and there, right? It really doesn't matter. The third, um, the third note is honestly more something that's uh, that's uh, two notes in one. But I'm discussing the alternatives to an anti pharaoh. So there's actually two very basic, uh, two basic things that can do the exact same thing as an anti pharaoh. The first thing you can do is they can actually just do the old school style thing of up jogging and down jogging cards, right? This might seem a bit primitive, and again, this is very slow. But if you're doing it from a smaller packet, from a smaller packet, you can't really do an anti pharaoh, right? But here you can just manually up jog and down jog cards, and then you're done, right? The second alternative for the anti pharaoh is that. You can actually just deal out cards into two packets alter alternating and then that accomplishes the exact same thing as an anti pharaoh so for example if i take uh, five cards over here and then i take five cards over here and I just deal them down alternating like so so pretend this is uh this is a complete deck right and i just ask the spectator to deal out uh, deal the deck out into two cards they basically did the anti pharaoh for me. This is the exact same thing as what an anti pharaoh does. You just need to complete the cut, and then the anti pharaoh is done, right? And what's really interesting is that the spectator does the uh, what the spectator uh, the anti the spectator does what the anti pharaoh does for you. So I think that's a really interesting sort of alternative or alternate handling they can do for the anti pharaoh. Um, I'm not sure in what context you would need to ask, but uh, to uh, like, I'm not sure in what context you would ask like the spectator to do that. But honestly, I think it's kind of cool that you can ask the spectator to participate 
in like a certain slate or a certain effect and then you know you can just uh just do that so that's uh, that's kind of cool so before i go i just want to go into some further reading so uh again you can go ahead and buy the anti pharaoh download by christian emblem uh which was published back in uh 2012 by dan and dave uh it's on vanishing inc right about now uh, there's also Ripping by Jeremy Griffith. That's a that's a principle that allows you to do an anti pharaoh. There's also Meditations on Ripping by Tibor Varga. That's a a bunch of collection of ideas and thoughts regarding Jeremy Griffith's uh, ripping. So if you want some ideas for for ripping, that's that's where you should go. The other thing is the One Handed Anti Pharaoh by Jared Crispell, which is honestly just a an anti pharaoh that uses a dribble. It's that's basically it. I think everyone came up with that, but he was just the first one to release it, so that's that's whatever. Um, there's also Ephemera by Dennis Kim. Uh, uh, he he teaches something called parting, and parting is basically the only anti pharaoh effect I actually do. Um, there's also Butterfingers by Quinn's Ludens. Um, there's a magician by the name of Chitose. Chitose actually teaches a false shuffle uh, using the anti pharaoh. And no, it's not just anti pharaoh, and then you just do a bridge. It's it's more complicated than that, but you know that's that's that. Right? You can go ahead and buy the download for that. Um, if you want to support Christian Emblem for letting me teach this move, you know, go buy his products and his ideas that he contributed to. So there's his uh, at the table live lecture that you can go buy with uh, Murphy's Magic. There's also the cooler, which is basically just a deck switch thing, which is kind of cool. Um, he contributed to the European Close Up Magic Symposium, uh, Volume 1. Uh, he contributed to Cards in Bag by Dominique Duvivier. Uh, Open Triumph from the Vault by Danny Dortiz and the Unreal Sessions 6 by a Paul, R. Paul Wilson. So you can go ahead and look at all of those resources if you want to support uh, Christian Emblem or if you want some further reading on uh, anti pharaoh and uh, related slides. And that's all for the anti pharaoh that's a, that's a long video. Uh, well, I did want to go through everything that I've learned over the years. Uh, well, mostly everything that I learned over the years uh, regarding the mechanics of the anti pharaoh Remember, this is just how I do the move. Find your own knack for the move, uh, but most importantly, be patient, practice consistently, and just pay attention to every single detail uh, that you're doing, right? And honestly, I think that you're going to be able to do the move with uh, if you just practice and be patient enough, right? And even if it's not perfect, that's completely fine. Again, there's not a single person who can do the anti pharaoh back to back to back perfectly, right? So just, you know, accept that you're going to do mistakes. And more importantly, remember to take breaks. Don't overdo it, because um, if you do this move too much, your hands are going to cramp up. That happened to me a couple of times while I was preparing for this video. So just take breaks, take it easy. You have all the time in the world to learn this, right? This is an essential move. Again, you can just take your time with it and just, you know, just practice it at your own rhythm. But yeah, I think that's going to be about it. Thank you for, um, thank you for uh, Christian Emblem for again, letting me teach this move. And more importantly, Stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, yeah, let's see you on the next video.